Today we're going to continue our study in the book of Acts, and we're going to learn why we're even here today. What is the reason for us being in this room together today? Acts chapter 2 tells us. The writer of the book of Acts is Luke. Luke wrote the third gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. He wrote that gospel to tell about all that happened in Jesus' life, his birth, his, his life, his teachings, his miracles, his uh, death, his resurrection, and then some of what would happen after that. And Luke told all of that, and then he realized there's so much more to this story as he saw it outflowing from God's heart. And so he wrote a, sec a sequel to that. We call it the Acts of the Apostles, the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, it tells what happened to the people who saw Jesus Christ resurrected. There were 500 plus people that saw him after he was resurrected. And God did some marvelous things. And one of the things that God said to them, Christ said to them was, you've got to wait for a gift. I got something for you to do, but you got to wait for a gift. And so last week we saw what that gift was. It's in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and then you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, right there, God said something's going to happen. You're going to get power. So last Sunday we said, we got the power. And we have the Holy Spirit living in us. And he says, now, with that power, I want you to go out and I want you to be a witness of what you have seen. Remember, most all of the people who, he's, who starts here at the beginning of the book of Acts had seen the resurrected Christ. 500 plus of them. He said, you've seen it. We're witnesses of it. It just happened 50 days ago. But then the day of Pentecost came. And that gift was given. And the central and key verse in all of the Bible is this verse in Acts. It's about God's people being empowered by the Holy Spirit to be his witnesses to the world. This is their power to accomplish their mission, to go to the world. And so today we're going to study Acts chapter 2. I think it's very fitting for our 10th birthday celebration because of the fact it tells us how the church began, what the church was all about, and why we're here today in this room. So let's pray and ask God to teach us from his word. And I'm going to read a lot of scripture to you today because it tells the story much better than I could ever tell it. And they will apply it to our lives. Let's pray together. God, thank you for every person in this room. I thank you so much for each of our individual lives and the way you have worked and are working in our lives. We're so grateful. You've been so good. We've sung your praise this morning, Lord. We've told you how much we believe in you and how grateful we are to you for all of your many blessings. Now we ask you to continue to help us understand who we are in Christ and what you have for us as those who are believers in the Lord are to be your witnesses wherever you send us, everywhere in our world, you are to be a witness through us. So may we hear your word, may we love it, may we rejoice in it, and may we obey it, Lord, as we leave this place today, for it's in your name we ask it. Amen. It's what we call the day of Pentecost, and there were thousands of people gathered together, a huge crowd. Thousands and thousands of people. And in Acts chapter 2, we see that Peter got the attention of that crowd of people. And he preached the first Christian sermon. You can read it in chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. But I want to pick it up in verse 22. Here's what Peter said. And boy, this really got to those people in the crowd. Remember, it's 50 days after Jesus' resurrection. And so it had been noised all over the place. Something amazing happened. 
Jesus, this guy who so many had followed, died. But now we're here and he's been resurrected and hundreds and hundreds of people are saying they saw him. And, 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 and so the people, there was anticipation because it had been noised all over Jerusalem. And so Peter started to speak and he said, verse 22, people of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus, the Nazarene, by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. You know, because he was very famous in this whole area. As a matter of fact, the whole city, uh, a week before he died, was putting palm branches down and praising him as their coming king. He says, you know about that Jesus. Then he goes on in verse 23. He said, but God knew what would happen. And his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed with the help of lawless Gentiles. Then here he zings it home. With the help of lawless Gentiles, those Romans, he says, you nailed him to a cross and you killed him. See, the Jews wanted to be able to say, oh, we didn't have any part of that. It was Rome who did that. It was, you know, it's Pontius Pilate who did that. It was, it was those Roman soldiers who did that. We didn't kill Jesus. He says, you killed him. And then he goes on. But God released him from the horrors of death, and he raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Hundreds and hundreds of us saw it happen, he said. So he goes on, verse 33. Now he, Jesus, is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see and hear today, because the people had seen this, this day of Pentecost the Holy Spirit came upon these people. The people were speaking in other tongues, nationality tongues that they, they didn't even know, but God gave them the ability to do that so that everybody could hear the message of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So he says, each of you, he says, brothers, what should we do? Pardon me, let's go back to uh, verses 37. Peter's words pierced their hearts. So as he was preaching, the word of God just pierced into their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, right there is the salvation message. Okay. Each of you must repent of your sins. That means turn from your sinfulness, acknowledge you've sinned and are so sorry for it. I no longer want that to rule in my life. Turn to God and then be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children and to those far away. What he meant by that was probably that that was promise was for you Jews, but it probably is also for the Gentiles because it's going to come to the Gentiles. And it could mean it's going to come to the whole world because that's where we were told to go and take the witness. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time. That gives encouragement to preachers, okay? Uh, because Peter preached a long time. And a lot of times people get tired of how long preachers preach, but uh, he did it. And he strongly was urging all of his listeners. Here's what he said. Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Repent. Believe. Follow the Lord. And here's the key. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. And right there was the beginning of the Christian church. Right there was the beginning of what now billions of people are a part of all over this world. The church of Jesus Christ. It starts with a community of loving, caring believers. 
Luke goes on now and tells how those Christians, those 3,000, started living their lives. And here's what he says. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. In other words, they wanted to learn the truth of Jesus Christ and to fellowship. In other words, they did life together. They knew each other. They loved each other. They cared for each other. They served each other. And to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, they ate together, and then they prayed, and they were very real people of prayer. As they were doing all of that, a deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place, and they shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. I mean, something had happened that was unbelievable, that took hold of their lives, so much so that they wanted to learn more and more about God's plan for their life. They wanted to learn more and more of what it meant to really know and love each other and care for each other. And if there's a need to meet those needs and serve each other and, and be together and become a family, become a church. There's radical fellowship, there was generosity, there was praying, and they were worshiping together. As a result, there were a lot of Christ-centered values and spiritual practices that started happening in that church. And as a result of that, two great things took place. Number one is in Acts chapter 2, verse 46. They worshiped together at the temple each day, they met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared their meals with great joy and generosity. And all the while they were praising God and enjoying the goodwill or the favor of all the people. The people there in Israel saw, my goodness, look at these people, how they know and love and care for and serve and, and, and love being together. They've got something that we don't have. And so it says in verse 47, And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. In other words, the church started reaching its world, and God's kingdom was growing. Now that was the start of the local church. There had to be hundreds of of house churches, because they really didn't have a place to meet. They didn't have a building. 3,000 people got saved, and more and more were being added. So they had to meet in homes, what we call house churches. They met together at the temple, daily at least, at least once a week, if not daily. But then they met in homes, and they had fellowship, and they prayed for each other. They cared for each other. They ate together. They took the Lord's Supper together. When people were hurting, they hurt with them. And when people were happy, they rejoiced with them. They served each other. They gave to each other. If there was a need, they met that need. Nobody had to be afraid. That was the New Testament church. And so, as believers today and as Simple Church, I believe we can have a powerful influence on the world, our world, wherever you are, our world. That's why we started this church 10 years ago. I'm going to tell you about it in a moment. But uh, what I want to do is to help you understand five undergirding principles that guide everything we do in this ministry. Because our goal is not to be a New Testament church because we're 1950 years later. But man, the principles that they had and the way that they did Worship of God and love for each other is what we want to do. And so these undergirding principles are, first of all, we believe as a body of believers, we are created to connect. And we believe that one of the saddest things in the world is if people come to church and nobody knows them, nobody sees them, nobody understands them. They have no way to receive any care or any ministry. And they go and they leave. And I think that happens so much in church today. So we decided when we began this thing, we're going to meet around circular tables. Because that forces people to have to look at each other. 
and it forces people to have to talk to each other and, and uh, get to know each other and fall in love with each other. So we are created to connect. And one of the reasons we have that connection time after the service where you sit and you talk is because we want you to be able to, if you've got a joy, to share it. If you've got a burden, to share it. If you have a need, let it be known so we can help you meet that need. Because we are in this together. We're a family. We're a body of believers that love each other because we love God and have been loved by God. And we want to be there to connect with you. And secondly, we're saved to serve. We're not just saved to be people who get to know a whole lot of stuff in our heads. But all that truth of Christ and his life is to be flowing out from our lives as we go out all week long to serve and to live for and to be there for others and to minister to them. We're saved to do something about what we believe. Paul tells us we've got to believe to be saved. But James says, if all you do is believe and there's nothing that flows out of that, you better question your salvation. Because Christ, when he comes in us, when that Holy Spirit, that power comes in us, it should be flowing. He should be flowing from our lives, touching the lives of other people. The third thing, we believe that we need to practice the way. And practicing the way means to increasingly daily know more and more about Jesus, who he is, how he lived, what he, what he taught, and, and the way he ministered it to people, and then to seek to let that just increasingly not only be our knowledge that we've learned and are learning, but now it flows out from our lives. And so it's built around spiritual disciplines, uh, things like of course, studying God's word and knowing more about Christ. Of course, prayer and meditation and being silent. But then practicing the way means that we let that flow out from our lives as we grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ and touch the lives of others. The fourth thing that undergirds everything we seek to do here at Simple Church is we're made to move. And we constantly emphasize the importance of the fact that, folks, church is not about you. Church is about God, and it's about you learning more of who God is in his heart, who Christ is, and how he showed us God's heart, and lived it out, and then letting that be coming from our lives, from our lips, from our witness. We're made to move out into this world and be witnesses of what we have seen and understood and come to believe in our hearts that Christ is the only hope of salvation for the world. And so we're made to move. And finally, we are blessed to bless. And one of the things when we started this ministry was we said, we want there to never be any fear in this church. And that means if somebody has a need, if you're willing to let us know that need, we'll do whatever it takes to come alongside and do the very best we can as a local body of believers to help you meet that need. That's why we have what's called a generous giving fund, and we say it all through the year. That fund is there. And, every, and this year we've given thousands and thousands of dollars already to help people. And we've given all kinds of hours of service and ministry to help people in their lives from this church. And we're, we're available to meet a need. If you have a need and you, that need's not met, and if it's a genuine need, I want you to know we're here to help. Because we are blessed to bless and we believe these five principles fulfill the very attitude and heart of what we read in Acts chapter 2. That's what the church was supposed to be. And, and in this day and age, if we aren't careful, and I have certainly been guilty of this in the ministry that I've had over the years, but we can get all caught up almost in, in looking too much at external things instead of what God said. He said, you know, this thing isn't to be complicated. Life's complicated, but church shouldn't be. And that's why we said, let's do simple church. Let's just be there for people. Let's just love the Lord. Let's just praise him together. Let's just know each other. 
and love each other and serve each other, care for each other. And as we do that, others will see, my goodness, those people have something in their life I don't have. They've got a community that I long for because my family's a mess. They've got someone who will come alongside them in a time of need and will really be there for them no matter what that need is. God says, that's what church is. I think we've uh, kind of, uh, there's a strong, I don't use it, I don't know how to even say it. Bastardize is the word I was going to say, okay? <laughs> but we've kind of bastardized the church and made it into a lot of what God doesn't want it to be. Because what he wants it to be is people who love him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And who love each other the way Christ loved us and gave himself for us. And then to let that be lived out through our lives all day long. That's church. So I praise God for the 10 years he's given us here. And for the way he's brought many, many people to this church. Half of the people that are part of this church aren't even here today. It's too beautiful to be here today. But I will tell you, I'm thrilled of what God has been doing. And I'm going to read a key statement as we close and sing. As we love God, as we obey his word, as we walk in deep community with one another, as we give selflessly, and as we pray continually, we believe we will once again be part of God's change. The change he desires for the world because of the power of the Holy Spirit. And my prayer is that your heart will be filled with praise to the Lord today as we are reminded of what he's done here and what he wants done in his church and, and that together our hearts will well up in praise and we'll say, oh God, you're worthy of all the gratitude of our hearts. So let's stand together and sing that kind of a testimony to our Lord.